they're yours. Hit that one more time. I am, I am the, the number one determinant, number one determinant of, the success of the success or failure. Or failure. Here we go. Of my uh, students. Hey, y'all, you have a strong summer. Kick some butt next year. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Love you guys. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, greetings. Welcome to week 138 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. Let me see who we got here. We got, we got John Few in the building. We got Zone of Education, says I'm from Pakistan watching your videos in sequence and having and happy that you're going to going live now so i you know i told y'all we worldwide man we ain't just here in the u.s we worldwide i appreciate you zone of education out there in pakistan watching the virtual ap leadership academy we got takesha high marsha poe is in the building first day of winter break yeah and uh, and, and congrats to all of you that got through the uh the first semester and here you are taking it down for a little while some of you still got some days next week i'll get more into that uh rodney richardson's in the building demetrius scott's in the building marina galano i believe is pronounced is in the building otis kitchen michael benton dr um rella hicks in the building that's down there in richmond county in georgia Lily Lanier, Scott Wiley, John Herrick, Rashad Davis, Gina Wilson, Michael Moore, my brother, Tony McClenney, Laura Mayer, Karima Anque in the building. I appreciate that, Karima. Dot McKeever Jeter, Siobhan Curry, Sherrod Laws in the building out there in sunny Melbourne, Melbourne, Florida. Whitney Smith. Yeah, oh, Rodney, yeah, you know I'm rocking Hank Aaron. See, the average person's not going to realize I'm rocking Hank Aaron. They're looking for Atlanta Braves, right? We going back to the Negro League, the Indianapolis Clowns. Uh, John, uh, Dr. Johnny Cruz, Craig, good to see you. We got the queen, my wife in the building, Kimberly Broughton, Kefele, uh, Lisa Jordette, Brittany Johnson, Willie Worley, my man, principal. East Orange Campus High School in the building. Hey, Principal Worley, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Hopefully we connect at some point. Uh, Renee Graham, Kimberly Carruthers, Jasmine Harris, Darnell McElveen, Hotep, Dr. Sheika Houston in the building. Y'all check out Create and Educate this morning with Dr. Sheika Houston and Dr. Tammy Taylor. They always bring in heat, man. If you, if you don't watch them, just, you know, just put it in your calendar. I don't know if, if they're taking off for the uh, holidays or not. I'm not. I'm going straight through, man. I'm going to be on here Christmas Eve. I'm going to be on here New Year's Eve, right? You know, last year I was on here Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So, you know, I'm going to be on here for the Eves, right? So, um, so plan on being with us, man. We got some dynamite folks coming on. We got Annette Mack in the building. Superintendent Peter Finch is in the building. Yolanda McKinney is in the building. Grace Castaneda is in the building. Jill uh, Par Parfait. Chase Langley out there in Oklahoma. Muriel, no, uh, no nonsense. Down there in Augusta. Cora Graves is in the building. Alicia Jeffers is in the building. Stacy Joseph. September. Devon Vance Daniels is in the building. There was a young lady that I had encountered on Facebook this morning that was just uh, appointed to assistant principalship. Uh, let me see if I could find her. Uh, she might be on here. In fact, I would I would think she's on here. Um, she was just appointed. 
and let me see if I could find him, man. I, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time looking, but if I if I could find him, man, I want to at least shout her out real quick and have you all congratulate her. Let me see, let me see. Yeah, I think I got it. Here it is. Here it is. Her name is Courtney Carter. So if Courtney Carter is here, reveal yourself on the on the thread. Courtney, Courtney was just appointed to assistant principalship. It it begins in January. That's the way I started. As I told her, I started in January 1998, right? That was a little, that was a couple of years ago, but she's just starting um, this coming January. So Courtney Carter, if you're in the building, let us see you on the thread so that we can congratulate you. I don't see, I don't see, I don't see you. But a lot of folks don't necessarily reveal themselves on the thread. They just watch, right? So I, I, you know, so I understand that. But anyway, I see everybody saying congratulations. So maybe she'll see it at some point. If not, I will, I will tag her later and let her know that we all are big upping you. So, so, so let me say this, y'all. Let me get it started, y'all. I'm, I'm kind of laid back, talking cool, man. Let me, let me, let me get a little fire in me. Hey, everybody. Let me say to you real quick. Good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week 138 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And as I always say, you see me smiling, man, because y'all know where I'm going. I don't, I don't know about you. I see you, Derek McCoy. I, good to see you. We're going to get you on here. I don't know about you. But if I could speak for me, because I think I know about you, because, I mean, y'all here. And it's a lot of you on here right now. But but let me just let me just let you know real quick, because, you know, the times they're always challenging, always. You know, we never have like a dull week. There's a, it's always challenging. But despite those challenges, I sustain my energy, my excitement, my enthusiasm. So if I could let you know, I'm on fire. Woo! Yeah, baby. That's how I'm feeling. Somebody just blew the horn, man. <laughs> I don't know if they heard me, but I doubt it. But hey, the timing was good. I see them fire emojis there too, y'all. Yeah, let hit the, hit me with that fire. Hit me with them flames so that I know you feeling that fire. I see you, Willie Wally. You say yes, sir. That means you feeling that fire. Let me tell y'all something, man. That fire is important. Somebody might watch me and they only know me like like, like just a little bit. They saw maybe one or two of these vids and they're like, what's up with him, man? You know, is that a gimmick? No, no. That's, that's how I feel, baby. That's what's in me. I can't do this work with, with, with like somebody douse some water all over me, man. I got to bring them flames. So, you know, I got a few things to say. I told my guests I got to take a couple more minutes than normal. Let me let me just ask you a question. Let me bring I, I need to bring it down. though. Let me bring it down. Hey, somebody out there right now got a question for you. How you feeling? That's my question. How you feeling? And are you OK? I'm serious right now. Like, like, like I'm bringing it down. How you feeling? And are you okay? You know, um, good brother, DJ Twitch, right? Man, you know, we all we all kept up with it. And we all continue to keep up with it. We see it. But you know something? It got me, you know, I think I would think a lot of us went into self-reflection during the week as a result of, of, of good brother DJ Twitch's suicide, right? I would think a lot of us went into self-reflection. A lot of folks even posted, you know, they were they were once in that space, right? I've never been in that space, never. But I want to say this to you. Between September 2002 and June of uh, 2005, I was not okay. I wasn't I wasn't suicidal, but I was not okay. I did some things, man. I, you know, I made some irrational decisions. This was this. I'm talking professionally now. I was not okay. 
stuff was happening. Local people here in Jersey and people who have picked up on some of my cryptic messages on, on Facebook and so forth, then, then you know what I'm talking about. You remember them years. You know, we're talking 20 years ago. I am planning on writing a book about that experience. I think it's necessary because I need I need leaders out there to know that, you know, you might you might love Principal Kefele and your man Kefele got it going on. You might that might be your perception. But Kefele has some tough times, man. Right. And and and, and that those three years, I mean, I did not want this. Somebody need to hear me. Those three years between September 2002 and June of 2005. I ain't want this. But I wasn't I didn't have the credentials to do anything else. So I was kind of stuck in this, but I didn't want this, not because of students, not because of staff. I was in a situation that just wasn't healthy emotionally. It just wasn't healthy. Right. Specifically between myself and my immediate supervisor, superintendent. It just was not healthy. So it created for me a very difficult way of working, right? It, it was horrible. And what makes, and what hurts me to the, to the core, to my core, I don't know if Vincent Stallings is on here right now, Dr. Vincent Stallings, but I brought him on as my AP. And he's, he, he's only worked with me in my worst of times. Now he'll, he'll be the first one to say I was great, right? But he only worked with me in my worst of times. He's never worked with me in my best of times. I brought him in when everything crashed and he was with me during that whole time. So when I left and I got the reset and began to soar again, he was back in the other school. So I'm saying that to say this to somebody. I want to ask the question. I know I got a guess. This is not a solo for me, but I got it. I just feel I feel compelled this morning. Are you okay? How are you feeling? Let's say your answer is, I'm not okay. I'm not feeling myself. And a lot of it has to do with this work called leadership. Then I'm asking you the question, what are you doing about that? Like who's in your circle? Who can you lean on? Who can you be most vulnerable with? Who can you talk to? Understand that it is not beneath you to seek therapy, mental health therapy. It's not beneath you, black man, who's watching me right now. Because that's the because that's the population of people who, who are least likely to seek therapy. So, so again, I'm talking to everybody, but hey, hey, my brother out there, it's not beneath you. It's not making you soft. If you seek therapy, particularly when you feel you need something, right? We don't want to see you do something to yourself and now you're no longer with us. Or you do something to yourself and you hurt yourself, right? So I'm saying again, I'm, and I'm going I'm, I'm to step away from this because I got a dynamite guest on, but, but you know, the suicide happened this week. You know, circumstances happened this week. So again... I'm asking you, who's in your corner? Who are you talking to? Who can you rely upon? Who can you be vulnerable with? And, and are you careful with who that may be? Because that might not be the person you need to be talking to. See, remember now, and I hate to go in this direction, but I got to keep it real. Sometimes the one you talking to is the very one that wants to see your downfall. Right. You you can never lose sight of that. The one you're talking to, there's Vincent Stallings. I hope you heard me, sir. Uh, I because I referenced you. Um, the one that you are talking to, the one that you have sought out might be the one that has been waiting for you to fall so that they can step into your place. Right. So you have to be careful with who you share with, who you're most vulnerable with because you, you don't want to give that person control of your situation, right? So make sure that you're aligning yourselves with people who genuinely care about you, people who genuinely love you, with people who genuinely have your back, with people who genuinely are in your corner, 
people who genuinely want to see you win, people who, gen who, who genuinely want to see you succeed, people who genuinely want to see you victorious. That's who you got to align yourself with. I'm not aligned with, align with people who want to see me fail. And, and, and you know, as trivial as this may sound, I know who some of those people are. I wouldn't know in terms of the world out there who just happens to follow Principal Kefaly on social media, but in terms of people who know me, I know which ones want to see me fail. I know which ones want to see me fall. Their body language speaks it. Their verbal language doesn't say it, but their body language, they can't hide it, man. Their verbal expressions, they can't hide it. I see it because you can't fake the funk. Not with no funk or tear. I'm a funk or tear, so you can't fake the funk with me. I'm going to see it, right? So I'm saying to you, I'm not going to confide in them folks. I'll greet you. I'll shake your hand. I'll say, how you doing? But I ain't giving you nothing. I ain't confiding in you because I understand, hey, somebody out there. But last point, which is a repeat, seek therapy. If needed, seek it out if needed, right? And it's probably needed with more people that even know it. During those three years, I needed it. But my ego would not allow me to seek out therapy on the one hand. But on the other hand, that wasn't even part of our, our lexicon back then. We weren't talking about no mental health in 2002, Right. We weren't talking about that then. That's 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 a more recent phenomenon. So if so, if 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 I was in that space now, I'd probably seek it out. Like, how am I going to deal with this mess? Right. So I had to say that. Let's go, y'all, man. I got a guest today. Let me just give these quick announcements. Uh, shout out to Newark, New Jersey Public Schools, East Central School Leadership Team. Under the leadership of Dr. Harrington, oh, man, we had a time this week, man. We had a time. I can't wait to get back with them. So that's Newark Public Schools East Central School Leadership Team. That's the principals and APs and so forth. Secondly, um, you know, I wrote the I wrote I had a column for Learning Forward this year. You know, that organization. And I was a, so I wrote I wrote a column every other an article every other month for my column. And two of those articles made the top 10 for the entire journal for the year. So um, I'm proud about that. You know, the kid from East Orange, <clears throat> two, not one article, but two articles make the top 10, man. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm elated about that. Let me just be honest. So you can go to my my uh, YouTube, my website, principalcafele.com, and I put them under my announcements page. Just click the link and it'll take you right there. And if you want to read all six of the articles I wrote, then just go to my website at principalcafele.com and click writings and you'll see them all right there on top. One of them is, hasn't been posted yet, but uh, the other the others are there. Um, quick uh, prayers to anybody in this family, our virtual AP Leadership Academy family who's been impacted by these storms out here this week. Right. Prayers to anybody. In our virtual AP Leadership Academy and beyond, but in this case, our virtual AP Leadership Academy family, anybody that's impacted by those storms, those those treacherous, dangerous storms that have been, have been impacting the country this week. Uh, prayers to you. Hopefully everybody is all right. And um, but I just want to make sure that you know that we're all thinking about you. If any of our family has been affected by that. Uh, welcome to all the first timers. My announcements are a little bit longer than normal today, but welcome to all the first timers. If you missed any of the previous 137 weeks and you can just go to the, the YouTube Virtual AP Leadership Academy YouTube channel and binge watch them all, man. They're all there, 137, and this will be number 138 today. The two books that accompany this academy, The Assistant Principal 50, The Aspiring Principal 50, get them at Amazon. They're there waiting for you. You can still get them before Christmas, your little holiday gift to yourself. And then while you're at it, get my newest joint, man. The Equity and Social Justice Education 50, critical questions for improving opportunities and outcomes for black students. So we were very specific with this one in terms of who I was writing it for. Educators of black children. That's who this is for. So if you don't have your copy yet, Amazon, get it now. Why are you wasting time? I'm rocking Henry Aaron, the Indianapolis Clowns Negro League. 
Let's go. My topic today is sustaining a commitment to your vision during these challenging times. I'm done with my announcements. Hit that share button and hit that like button, man. I keep telling y'all, the folks out there that know more than me about social media, you know, what do I know? I'm born in 1960. I'm 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 old school. What do I know? But the but them new heads, those young heads out there, they said, um, you got to tell people to hit the like button, especially on YouTube. Right. So hit that like button, man. Like like voice walking says like, 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 like hit that hit that like button, man. Hit it. Hit that like button, but hit that share button and let them know we are here and we are in the building. I got a guest today, man. She's a superstar principal. I mean, she you know, she transitioned to another position, but once a principal, always a principal. That's why I'm principal Kefele and I ain't done it in 12 years. But once a principal, always a principal. She transitioned to another position which we're going to talk about today but in the meantime i want to bring her on up here and and, and let me change my background there I, i'm supposed to be on top of that but here we are that's not the right one here we are there we go there we go we got dr stacy mabry in the building hey, hey. dr mabry how are you i am well i am well that's good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to see you. This is a long time coming. I, I, you know, I had, I guess I had some kind of scheduling glitch the last time, but we made it happen now. And here you are, you know, before we jump into anything, let me let the folks that don't know who you are, who you are by reading your bio quickly. Y'all wait, y'all be patient with me while I read this. You know, every time someone sends me a bio and, and sometimes they're longer than others. And I feel compelled to read them because it tells the story and a lot of times the bio is the story as well it's not just the 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 dialogue but the bio lets you know here's somebody that's that's worked hard to get to a place so let me read this to y'all stacy mabry is a 1992 graduate of south carolina state university in orangeburg south carolina there it is there it is my son was next door at claflin but we talking about south carolina state right now uh after matriculating from South Carolina State, she continued her education at Augusta State University, receiving her master's and specialist degree in education, leadership, and, and administration. I'm reading fast, y'all. From there, she went on to receive her doctorate in curriculum studies from Georgia Southern in May 2012. While on the campus of South Carolina State, she was fortunate enough to meet to seek membership into, she said, the best sorority, Delta, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a faithful and active member of Delta Dr. Mabry has served in numerous capacities, including Southern Region Chair of the Leadership Academy, Grow with Google, Black Women Lead Initiative Co-Chair, and National Level Master Trainer. Professionally, Dr. Mabry has been employed by the Richmond County School System in Augusta, Georgia for 29 years, spending 10 years teaching in high school science, six years as the K-12 Science Curriculum Coordinator, four years as the Senior Director of Curriculum Instruction, eight years the proud principal of George P. Butler High School. During her time as high school principal, she purposely and intentionally worked on climate and culture. Watch this, y'all. Using Kefele's mood and lifestyle definition as the foundation of the work. Wow. By focusing on climate and culture and instituting innovative academic programs such as AVID, Dr. Mabry and her staff moved Butler High School. High school's graduation rate from an inherited rate of 34% in 2014 to a high of 80%. Dr. Mabry has a love and passion for the work. She uses the hashtag love supreme to describe the depth of her commitment and love for her kids. On July 1st, Dr. Mabry transitioned into district level position as the MTSS multi-tiered systems of support coordinator for Richmond County. This new challenge provides a larger arc of impact on the educational access and opportunities of all 32,000 students in the district by focusing on their cognitive, social, emotional needs and wraparound supports. It is truly putting students in the center of the equation. And then lastly, Dr. Mabry's life philosophy is tethered to the idea that each of us is created on purpose and with purpose. It is our mission to fulfill our God-appointed destiny. Her favorite modern-day orator, Barack Obama sums it up best by saying focusing your life solely on making a buck shows a certain poverty of ambition. Let me say that. Let me say that again. Focusing your life solely on making a buck shows a certain poverty of ambition. It asks too little of yourself because it's only when you hitch your wagon to something larger than yourself 
that you realize your true potential. I say amen to that because I'm, I'm living that. She is so glad that she hitched her wa wagon to education 29 years ago. It has taken her to places unseen and given her joy unimaginable. It is a love supreme. Hey, Dr. Mabry, you've done a lot in your, your years, man. You um, That's an amazing, amazing bio. And I'm, I'm sure if it was written in resume form, there's probably so much more that's there in terms of your accomplishments so let's let's dive into it a little bit let me get my comments back up here hey dr mabry um as i ask all my guests as an educator who is dr stacy mabry well stacy mabry is um an accidental educator somebody who um, went off to college at south carolina state without a thought of being an education major didn't didn't want it Teachers don't make any money, and that whole whatever. But going back, thinking about it, in truth, everything I had ever done, even in high school, middle, junior high, whatever, was always babysitting, camp counselor. I had a love for the work, but I ran from the work. Um, each opportunity that I have gotten, honestly, um, I've kind of been tapped for. Even the principalship, I was a, a curriculum director working at the central office minding my business, doing my thing, and got called to the superintendent's office. And he said, we need a leader for the school. And we can only think of one person. And I said, well, who? Stacy Mabry, who? me? Um, and we'll say that of all of the opportunities that I've had, um, being a high school principal has been the best, the pinnacle of it all. Um, so somebody who's devoted to the work, who's devoted to kids, who's devoted to kids' outcomes, but didn't necessarily see myself in the role when mm -hmm. I was imagining who I would be at 18 years old when I went off to school. So. Wow. Wow. So so here, here you are in the field of education and you've been in this field for a long time. This is not and, and you know, I say this to anybody and, I, and, I'll, and I'll debate. I'll debate anybody. This is not easy work, but it is highly self-fulfilling. Right. It is highly rewarding work particularly when, you, when you're committed to it, when you're devoted to it, when you're passionate about it. So my question to you is, with this long haul you've been on and probably a, a, a very long haul that you're going to continue, what is it that fuels your passion in this work? How do you continue to do it and at a high level? I think what fuels my passion really is um, the outcomes for kids, which is why I think the principalship was probably the most important thing because as a principal, when you make a decision in a building, you automatically see the outcome of that decision. You can automatically see the fruits of your labor. Working at the central office is, is, is excellent, but it's several layers down till you get to the kid and to the actual family. So what really fuels me are those kids that come back. Because right now, when I think about my span, my students range from 45, 46 to 14, because I left the principalship in July. So the, the oldest, the oldest people that I've ever taught, they're in their 40s. And I still see them, you know, as we're tooling around. Uh-oh, hope you come back. If you hear me, you might need to log out and come back in. You you all stay there because I can I can I can fill in the gap until we get it back. Yeah, Dr. Mabry, um, log out and come back in. And while and while Costa. we're, uh, hey, Doc, you you you're freezing. Um, yeah, yeah, you you keep on freezing. Uh, no, nah, you, you yeah, right now you're good. Okay, I'm back. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna be prayerful. All right. Uh, what I was saying is, the kids that I've taught are between ages 45 and 14. Um, and I still get people that come back and say, I remember in my in your class when we did so and so this impacted my life. So I think that's what keeps you going, working with kids and knowing that the kids are being empowered to be able to be the expression of their highest self because of the work that you put in. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So keep keep your phone handy just in case that happens. Uh, if it, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, you are, ultimately you decided that you want to be a building leader right and 
I think about that transition probably more so now that I have this platform for we're in year three now, probably more than I ever did because this I ask this question all the time. I think about that transition and, and I think about it in a multiplicity of different ways. With yourself, you made a decision at some point that I want to lead a school. Why did you make that decision? What was the motivation and what was it that you felt that you could accomplish as a principal that you couldn't accomplish as a classroom teacher? Um, well, like I said, I was actually tapped for the opportunity. Um, somebody saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself. Yeah. Um, when I went into the whole leadership training programs um, that the district offered and, and took the classes, um, I saw the classic assistant principal, principal kind of um, pathway. But in truth, um, I went to the central office and did some amazing work and really enjoyed that work and thought, well, gosh, there are lots of ways to do this. When I was tapped for the opportunity, the, the key is whether you tap or whether you apply, there's a point in the, in the moment when you say yes. Because you could always just say, no, I, that's not for me. Yeah. Um, and when I said yes, it really made me think about the fact that I am ultimately responsible for the trajectory of 800 kids. What can I do to move 800 kids? And a lot of times, you know, you put together innovative programs at the central office level or at the state department level, but how do they really um, break down to help a kid? And you can get to see that work happen. And, and that was my motivation. You know what? I was scared. I'm not gonna say I didn't shed a couple of tears because I was nervous. Yeah. yeah. But the idea that I would be responsible, much like a classroom teacher is responsible for that 150 or that 30 that they have, I was responsible for 800 kids in their lives and it was important to me. That's right. And that's, that, that was around ballpark, my numbers as well. And I, I know something about that, you know, that, that, that fear, that anxiety, making that transition into that, that, that very different position from being in a classroom, you know, folks, um, before I move on, hit that share button, hit that retweet button, hit that like button, let them know we are here. Our topic again, sustaining a commitment to your vision during these challenging times. You know, Doc, let's let's talk about that word vision. And and you know, vision is like one of my words. You know, you talk about Mount Rushmore of words, and vision is like right there. Purpose is another one for me, intentionality. And 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 you know, I, I think, and this is just me, I think that word vision sometimes is is taken lightly. I think it's misused. It for for me, it's 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 a very powerful word. You're a visionary. You were a visionary principal, obviously, right? Your your data speaks for itself. What is what does this word vision mean to you, as it relates to your leadership? To me, vision is where I see the end game. So it's all about what do I want to ultimately accomplish, and then how do I plan to get there? Um, and the vision for Butler High School was pretty. Um, Pretty simple. Well, it was simple to me. Um, the State Department gives every school a number, just the, the, how the State Department keeps up with schools. And our school number was um, 1052, so 1,052. So from there, trying to think about where did I want kids to go, where did I want our school to go, I created a, um, our branding. Because again, once you figure out what your vision is, you got to be able to brand it and so folks can understand it. So we use 1052 as the, the branding mechanism. So we had one mission, educating and empowering tomorrow's self-sufficient citizens with zero excuses because students were our core mission. We had five strategies for success, which included data-driven instruction, effective communication and collaboration, rigorous instruction um, and balanced assessment, sustained student services and shared leadership. And all of that was achieved by two roles because I believe there are only two types of people in the school, those who teach students and those who support those who teach students. Mm. And the most important role in a school building are those who teach children. Everybody else is um, support to make sure that teachers can get, make the main thing the main thing. Yeah. So 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 let's let's go to George P. Butler High School. So here you are. You you come in. You 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 were reluctant, but you but but someone sees within sees in you what you don't necessarily see within yourself. And here you are this principle i'm going to assume that there was a there's this 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 period of time when you're just trying to figure it out you're trying to figure out what what, what this environment is that i'm in but you're also trying to figure out who am i in this new capacity so as you figure those variables out 
what was it that you envisioned for your new school? Like, like you saw, and let me let me preface this by this question by saying this. I always <laughs> I'm known to say that you have to take ownership of the vision. You've got to own the vision. You've got to embrace the vision in order for it really to become yours, right? So, so with that said, what did you see that this school can become because you were at the helm? Well, and again, you talked earlier about my, if you read my resume, it would give you some, some additional details. A detail left out of my bio is I taught at Butler High School. So as an alternative certification teacher, deciding that I want to be a teacher, the first principal to hire me was um, a man named David Smith from Butler High School. And I spent 10 years at Butler High School as a classroom teacher. So when I came back as principal, I mean, I spent some years at central office. And then when I came back as principal, what I saw was um, students and grandchildren and children of students that I had already taught. Mm. I saw the neighborhood. My sister, Tanya, is a graduate of George P. Butler High School. Mm. My nieces are graduates of George P. Butler High School. And Augusta is not a small place. We have 10 high schools. But I just I knew how great it could be because I knew people who were impacted by their time there. And I wanted to take that experience and make sure that kids had what they needed. Again, um, Butler had just went through some transition. But with a 34 percent graduation rate, and that's a cohort graduation rate, what people were saying when they let their children come to Butler High School when I first got there is that my kids have a two thirds chance of not getting a diploma. Mm. And, and that was heartbreaking. Yeah. And I just it just it didn't sit well with me. So coming in, one of the, the things that I really wanted to do was to to move the graduation rate, bring some innovative programs in because we had to kind of resuscitate it and bring her back to life. Because George P. Butler, again, like I said, my sister went there, athlete, homecoming queen, all of those things in the 90s. And I knew what Butler could be because I taught there and I, and I knew these kids. And because of the way Augusta is situated, um, a lot of kids who go to Butler now. And when I was a the principal there, they are the children of kids that I taught. Wow. So nothing worse than getting in trouble in school. And then your mama have to come to the school and you sitting there thinking, well, my mom going to get the principal to business. And when, the, when your mama comes in, Miss Mabry, this is my teacher. Hot yeah. dog, I got them. Yeah. So I mean, I'm a part of the community. I'm a part of, of who they are because I was their teacher. I was there with them when they were going through it and they knew they could trust me with their children. I love that. I love that. That's see, that's one of the things I regret not staying long enough to be able to experience that. I experienced it on a very small scale, but um, but here you you got to live that. You know, there's there's another word. It's not on my Mount Rushmore, I don't think, but it's but it's but it's another one of those strong words that I think we sometimes take lightly. And the word is commitment, which is part of our our our, our topic today. Commitment. It's easy to be committed to something when things are going well. That's, that's easy. It's going well, so let me stay focused on. Let me stay on my grind, making this thing happen. But when them obstacles pop up, them adversities pop up, those challenges, those pressures and demands, those detours, etc., then that word commitment starts to get kind of blurry, right? And, and 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 I want to ask you when you think about your work, because I'm I'm going to assume that it wasn't easy to go from a 34 percent graduation rate to uh, to 80 percent. I'm 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 sure that there were just countless challenges that accompanied that. So talk to us, therefore, what did this word commitment mean to your work? To me, commitment means all in, and um. I know at some point we're going to talk a little bit about because we talked in the in the opening about self care and taking care of yourself. Yeah. Um. And you often hear people talk about that work life balance. Um. But I'm going to tell you when you make the decision to take on a principalship, work life balance is more like work life equilibrium. You do the best you can, but it it, it takes over. You 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 create a space where you're all in. Um. And that and all in from um not only just the instructional work and the discipline work, but even the extracurricular activities, because kids want to see you there. If they know you care, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna wanna see your face. They're gonna want you to be a part of, of what's going on with them. So the idea that, that, you, that this is not, if you're looking at moving into administration for one, because you wanna get away from the classroom, wrong answer. 
Right. Um, and if you want to move into administration because two, oh, they make more money. The money doesn't it. The money isn't a thing. Um, these are people's lives that you're dealing with. And you want to be able to give the same measure to other people's kids that you want for people to give to your kids. Um, and you're right. It's easy to say, oh, I'm so committed. Everything's going well. But um, running an urban high school has its challenges only because, you know, schools are microcosms of the communities that they serve. So if there's violence in the community, there'll be, you know, violence will make its way into the school, um, gang, whatever it is. So you have to be willing to say, you know what, I've got to create a safe space for kids here um, so that when they leave that community, they come here, they see something different that may alter the trajectory of their life. So um, it is committed work and there really are no days off. There's no time off because yeah. if somebody breaks into the building at one o'clock in the morning, they're going to call you the principal I'll call to, you. Um, to open the door for the police, for them to look into the room. Definitely. So it. <laughs> It's everything. It's everything. Everything. So let so let me bring these two words together now: commitment and vision. And 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 my question then is: How would one go about sustaining a commitment to a vision when that vision is starting to look unreachable? Well, I think it all kind of falls into um, the supports you set up around yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Who's your mentor? Who's in your circle? Um, the loneliest job in a school district, probably other than superintendent, is principal. Because the principal is the only other person, you're the only other person in that building who does what you do. So who is that circle outside of the building that you seek advice from? Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about bringing up that mirror. What are your self-reflective practices? Because even when things are going well, and I think that's probably a, a, a bad trait that I have, when things are going well, I, I still got the mirror out saying, mm, we got to 80 percent, but what, why couldn't we get to 81? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always that that next thing that you're thinking through. Um, what are you surrounding yourself with? Uh, what podcast are you listening to? Are you on the AP uh, Virtual Academy? What books are you reading? I can tell what you care about when I look in your um, look at your catalog of books and podcasts that you um, are engaging with. Leadership is important to me. Um, even when you read my bio, even in the sorority, um, I work with the leadership development um, arm of Delta Sigma Theta for the National Leadership Academy. Why? Because I think that everything rises and falls on leadership. So this idea, of, of even when the vision gets shaky, what are those supports you turn to? What's the research that you fall back on? But who is your mentor? Who is that one person that you can be the most vulnerable with like, you know what? This ain't working. Mm. I done messed this up. Mm. And you might use a four little word to say how you messed it up. Mm -hmm. Help me. Who are those people that you that you rely on? Because it, it gets hard. It, it absolutely does. It gets hard. So so along the same lines, then, Doc, there's there's an assistant principal watching right now. I don't know who they are, but I, I, I just feel them. Right. There's an assistant principal watching right now who went on to grad school, worked hard, came out with the 4.0 or higher, um, got the position ultimately, and all that enthusiasm that they had has now waned. It's not there because of the reality of their situation because everyone's, you know, different AP situations are different, as you know. So their situation is, this ain't what I went to school for. This, 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 this is not what I signed up for. This is something else. Talk to that person, Doc, about sustaining a commitment to the vision, despite the fact that walking into that building right now seems it seems taxing. It seems it's, it's, it's a burden. It's I think I want to go back to the classroom. What do you have for that person? Because I bet you that person is on here watching right now. Well, I'm going to say this and and it can. It looks like a fairy tale. It looks like a really great thing. The grass is always green on the other side. Oh, when I become an assistant principal, blah, 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 blah. When I become the whatever, whatever. Um, same advice. Who's your circle? What, what other assistant principals, people who have the same job that you have, who do you talk to? Who do you um, bounce ideas off of? But again, who's that mentor that you have? Who is that person who is doing what you ultimately would like to do and doing it well? 
Um, who do you who can you talk to? And then think about what you do in the building that has the most impact on students and do that thing well. Um, I know there's sometimes that schools, um, depending upon how leadership sees things, and I'll say this just in defense of principles, no principal has a diabolical plot to overthrow the educational system. Hmm. We're all in it trying to, to make a difference, but depending upon how they view themselves, what insecurities they have, it comes off all different kinds of ways. Um, and sometimes assistant principals are relegated to specific spaces because of the way that the principal sees the way that this should work. But again, think about the impact. Where are you having your greatest impact? So even if you're um, tasked to be the yard dog and you roam in halls, how can I take that opportunity and impact the work and the life of a kid? How can I lend energy to assist to make things better? Um, and again, it's, it's gonna be taxing. There are gonna be those days when you think, what in the world, who in the heck left the gate open? Yeah. But again, realizing that your ultimate mission is to impact students' lives for the better. And how can you continue to do that, even if you are relegated to a, a different space? I love it. I love it. You know, um, Dr. Mabry, there's a um, let me let me let me let me let me isolate another AP. And when I say when I say isolate one, I'm really talking about whatever the number are out there that may be feeling the uh, the sentiment. There's a, there's an AP out there that does not have a healthy work life balance. There's there's an AP out there who is who is is doing like 90 10, like 90 percent of the time on the job, thinking about the job, engaged in the job, 10 percent off the job. Right. Or it could be even 99 one. Right. Whatever it is. But there's somebody out there that feels that I got to go hard. I got to go hard in order for me to get to the next level or for me to experience whatever the success is that was, that my vision said, this is where I want to be, but it's not healthy. It's not healthy emotionally and thereby physically. So going back to, to my monologue, you know, are you okay? How are you feel? That person's not feeling well, but they're going through the motions of this work, but, but they know within themselves, I'm not okay. I'm not feeling well. I'm not enjoying this work. And, and that can lead from one thing to another, to another, to another, where now you're in a bad situation. Doctor, maybe you've been in this business for a while. Mm -hmm. What could you say to that individual that's going about it in a way where I'm, I'm imbalanced, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not level? All right. And again, you know, the balance is never gonna be 50-50, but if you feel like it's a pull or a strain, Again, you have to talk to somebody um, professionally. Again, I can't speak enough about a mentor. I can think about a time last school year in the midst of just everything going on. Um, I think being a pandemic principal was probably the toughest part of the job. And even when we were sitting at home in isolation, just worrying about what was next, what was next, what do I do? How do I keep kids safe? How do I, you know? And then when they came back in the building, um, we were, um, we had the misfortune in my district to lose several employees, including an assistant principal to COVID. Wow. So just the fear of what would happen next. And what happened was that just made me run a mile a minute. And it literally was my mentor. I called her one night um, on the way back from a basketball game and it was 930 at night. We played some school in rural Georgia, probably about an hour and a half away from Augusta. And it was 930. And something had happened and I was calling her to ask her advice and I was probably on 27. I was just, blah, blah, blah. and the, you know, the meter only goes to 10. And she, she said, where are you? And I told her, she said, okay, stop, pull over, stop, take tomorrow off. You've got to unplug from this. This is not healthy for you. Mm. And I said, no, 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 I can't. I said, because we got so-and-so tomorrow and then the basketball team is going to such, such. And, I, and she said, no, and she's not in my district. She's not even in my state. She said, no. she said, sis, I can't let you go any further with this. Hmm. You are going to burn yourself out. Breathe, calm down, take tomorrow off. You've got to unplug from this for a while. So for that assistant principal that feels like it won't get accomplished, you know, you hate to say it, but sometimes things have to fall apart for them to really be put back together. Yeah. And you can't sacrifice yourself. Um, you can't sacrifice yourself. 
Yeah. I'm not saying the kids aren't worth it. They are. The kids are worth it. The system is worth it. Absolutely. But you have to have that person in your life who doesn't have a problem tapping you on the shoulder or tugging you or talking to you 200 miles away saying, no, sis, that's enough. This is not healthy. Not healthy. You know, Dr. Maybe you, you, you said something in your, in your initial comment to, to the question that resonated with me the whole time you were speaking, you said, it's not going to be 50, 50. Right. And I heard, I, I heard something else. And when, which is when you said that, and I want to share that the hidden message to when you said it's not 50, 50 was this for me, this is the way I took it. This thing called school leadership is not for everybody that goes to grad school. Nope. This this is for sir. You yeah, you might come out of there with your 4.0, but it doesn't but that doesn't necessarily translate into this work being for you. Because if if you require that 50-50 and you can't uh, attain that 50-50, then this may not be for you. Maybe you need to look at another area of education if you want to be in education, but this thing called school leadership because I because I'm with you, it, it can't be 50-50. You and I can't be optimally effective if we're striving for 50-50. Because that be, because just by definition of what school leadership is, it's gonna require a heck of a lot of us. So therefore, we got to be wired to be able to do this job. And if I'm not wired to do this job, or I'm not willing to do this job at that level because I need that other portion of me, might might want to look for something else. Absolutely. And, and and let's and if you have, you know, husband, children, my nieces and nephews, as a principal, they signed up for uh Butler High School basketball games when they were in town from college. Like, oh, we hanging out with Auntie. Oh, dinner in the game. I mean, that was that was a part of what happens. That's the that's the real work. Um, and they knew that. And but again, because they were on my team, because they love me, they realized I have to give her the space to be able to get that done. And no, she's not. She may not be able to be at um, like my first year as principal. My niece was playing for another high school and I was, you know, Miss Auntie. I was at every game. I was serving in the concession stands at the other high school. Well, when I became a principal at Butler, we didn't play them. Mm. So I had to hear about her <laughs> basketball career kind of on the phone and FaceTime after it was over because I was committed to the students that I had that I was serving. And I don't think she saw that as like robbery. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. Hey, Doc, sustaining a commitment to your vision during these challenging times. You know, you. I, I want to quote you from your bio. You said your philosophy is tethered to the idea that each of us is created on purpose and with purpose. Again, philo my philosophy is tethered to the idea that each of us is created on purpose and with purpose. So with that, and here's another one of my words, purpose, that I say is another one of those misused words. It's, it's, and when everything's going well, it's cool. I'm, I'm walking in my why. You know, that's how, that's how it goes. I'm, I, I'm, I wake up to my why, right? Mm -hmm. But now things got a little dicey. You still walking in that why? Or did you veer off to the right or to the left, see? So, so, so with that, this word purpose in the context of school leadership, right? Because I and 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 you as you know, because you've watched a lot of these sessions, Doc. So you know I spend a lot of time isolating, talking to the young heads who are on here, right? Sometimes I say, let me get into the camera and yell at y'all, holler at y'all. So thinking about that youngster, and I use that word, you know, just facetiously, but that 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 young head that's out there watching that I I can't wait to get into this this position and all that. This word purpose, what does that word purpose mean to you in the context of school leadership? Purpose is, is ultimately, like you said, it's that why. It's that intentional thing that you want to do, that you plan to do to make an impact. Um, and something that probably when I was a younger head, I guess, um, I used to hear people say all the time, you got to go slow to go fast, you got to go slow to go fast. And the truth of the matter is you have to be intentional to go fast. And what happens is a lot of times we get these new positions and we move a mile a minute and we're not as intentional and we're not as focused. 
Um, so then it feels like, oh, well, I'm not living in my purpose. Yes, you are. But when challenges come, when trials and tribulations come, that's a part of the purpose too. That's the purpose building piece. Um, I'm just going to share a, a, a quick story from me. Uh, when I first became the principal, you know, I had my plans. I was doing my thing. I, you know, ready. Um, within the first 89 days of school, I lost my first student to gun, gun violence. Mm. Um, young man, alpha student, uh, played on the football team, was just that guy. Everybody liked him. Just that guy. Um, but he lived another life in the in the valley. He just lived a different life outside of school. He had, had some things going on. And because of things that happened, he was killed. Um, and because of the social media place that we are now, um, when he was shot, somebody thought it was good to film it. And it was on Facebook Live. Mm. Um, so not only is a, 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 a contributing member of, of our school community um, who everybody liked has now um, succumbed, but now the entire world has seen it. And then the next day, going back into the building, uh, myself and um, my my administrative staff, I called them the A team. Me and the A team going back into the building, and you have never sensed grief like that in my life. I mean, kids were just sad. They sent counselors, but the kids didn't want to talk to those people because they didn't know them. Right. They only, and I had only been there 89 days and I was um, one of the people that they sought counsel from. When I had to go meet with that young man's parent just to, to take, you know, I'm Southern, so I had to take some I take some food over yes. and check on folks. Um, the first thing that his mother asked me to do was speak at his funeral. And I said, well, ma'am, I've only known him 89 days. She said, oh, but he loved you so much. I would just I, I would be so honored if you speak at his funeral. And Dr. Mabry, can, can we bury him in his football uniform with his helmet? That's a purpose shaken moment yeah. when you realize just how important you are to the trajectory of a family's life and the legacy of their kid. And if you get in those moments and you think, oh, this ain't for me, then it's not. Find something else. You've got to be able to sojourn on. You've got to be able to move forward. You've got... Because again, it um, this young man's passing fundamentally affected the way that I saw how I educate students. Every student has a, um, a purpose. Every student has a right to be here. Whatever they got going on in their family life or outside of here, that's not my business. My job is to show them something different so that maybe they can get out of what situation that they're in. Again, just changed my life. I, I can relate to that. Um... You know, I, I appreciate you sharing all of that. My um, when I became principal at North Tech, and that was my first time working in a high school. Uh, we start in September in Jersey, so on the first week or second week of October, one of my students died of a heart attack in in, in uh, physical education. He was just jogging on the basketball court and he died. And I was new to the building, but I was also new to the district, so. My experience was like your experience. Um, folks leaned on me. Um, I too was asked to speak at the funeral. Uh, I spent probably every day at the family's house. And, um, you know, in, in, but, but what happened was that school came together in a way that I don't know was going to come together like that so quickly under a new leader, you know, and, um, and it allowed me to just demonstrate my authenticity at the time that that happened while I was still trying to figure at, figure it all out and navigate the entire experience of being this high school principal. But um, it shows that they control, you know, it builds trust. Yeah, they, this yeah. lady really means what she says, because uh, another thing, and it again, just kind of started as something I did, um, you know, I learned from you about, you know, having that morning message. So I didn't do the morning message. We had a morning show, but I felt compelled every afternoon to do afternoon announcements. I'm always, I'm going to be the last voice you hear before you go home. There you go. And literally, and the kids used to laugh, but then after a while they'd be like, why did she say it? Um, I would say, be safe and be good. And remember, Dr. Mabry loves you. And then they'd be like, you don't really love us. Yeah, I really do. I, even, even when I don't like you, I love you. Yeah. So just that idea that, that, you're committed to your word and that when you say you're going to show up and that I'm here for you, I'm going to show up and I'm here for you. Whether it's weddings, baby showers, basketball games, 
little league games, whatever. I'm here. And that's why the, this hard for the balance. You know, I'm, I'm going to go way off script because you just said something. You said the afternoon announcement. You said I'm going to be the last voice you hear. And you said it, and I probably could move on, but I don't want to move on, right? Because that was my, you know, you, you probably heard me say that before as well, but I don't say it much on this platform, that the last voice that I want them to hear is going to be mine, just like it was the first voice that they were going to hear was going to be mine. Talk to us. I'm off script now, Doc. Why is the why is that important for you that the principal's voice is the last voice? And I'm and I'm, and I got I got the APs who are watching who aspire to become principal one day as to why I would repeat this. Right? Why um why is that why would that be important? I mean I mean think about it. Who's doing that? Right. That's that's not normal or common practice that right before that dismissal bell, the principal jumps on the PA system. Why would you deem that so important? Because I just felt like, again, it's, it was that that closing message, that way of um, tethering me to them. I, I was one of those principals that like we got. I think the kids got out of school next week on Tuesday, half day. As much as I need, you know, you need a break. I used to hate breaks coming up. Because I knew that every kid didn't go home to somebody who had their best interest at heart, even if it was their mom and dad. They didn't all go home to the best situations. So I wanted them to hear, like, literally, that if nobody else has told you today, you know that I love you and I want you to take that home with you and I'll see you in the morning. So, I mean, I, to me, that's important um, just to let them know how you feel about them. Again, I was a principal who, of course, not, I aspired, but I could never get to those daily messages, but I had principals chats with my students where I was the one that talked to all of them and we went over the school's data and we talked about what they needed to work on, academics, culture, and expectations. I would issue challenges to them and they knew just as much about um, what was going on academically for our entire school as anybody, as the teachers did sometimes. Why? Because it was important. This is your school. This is, this is, um, you're representing this. And again, when you take over an urban school um, and the urban school has that 34% graduation rate um, and we were in a building that was built in the 60s. So it was just, it was, a, the building was horrible. They were building us a new building on the same campus, but they put us in these portable classrooms. Um, so what happened was every time it rained, my kids got wet. Every time it was cold, they didn't want, they didn't want to come to school because it was just, it was awful. It was like Beirut conditions to me. Mm. Um, so when the architects were building the school and we could see the building going up, I had a chat and I brought the architects drawing boards and the renderings. And we talked about what colors we were going to pick out. This is your school. This is your community. You deserve this building. Twenty four million dollars. You deserve this. And we're going to take great care of it because it's ours. It's our community. South Augusta needs this. So it was important to, for me to make those connections um, with kids. Again, I was one of those, um, I was a hall roving principal. I had a nice office. My office was really actually beautiful. Um, but I spend, spent most of my time as a principalship in the cafeteria in a mobile office or somewhere else in the building. I did, unless I did emails on my phone or my watch um, or reports, I did my reports out where the people were. If I had some, I had to get done. Most reports were done after 2.30 when the kids left because I wanted to connect. I wanted just to have those conversations they were walking by I'm like, oh, look, look at you today. Oh, you got the new Jordans. I'm talking to you because I want to know you. I want to get to, and that's the kind of teacher I was as well. So, so, so to the to the to the young heads out there who are not yet in your position, your principalship, or to the ones who are new, I don't care if there's nobody else in your district that deemed that final announcement to be important, and therefore no one does it. At least take the note down. And then try it out when you get into that position. And you may find that that may alleviate a whole lot of things that could happen, that could occur beyond the dismissal bell. Because one, one of the things I said, like, like, like let, me, let me just recite this real quick. I'm still off script. Here's my mic. As you leave this afternoon, remember, you are representing North Tech. You are representing Principal Cafele. You are representing our staff. You are representing your parents and community. But most importantly, you are representing 
yourselves. Do not misrepresent. Man, it felt good doing that just now, Doc. <laughs> take him back. Take him back. <laughs> Woo! I ain't done that since. <laughs> Let me go apply for a principalship somewhere, right? They're, they're out there. <laughs> All right, let's let's go. So, so 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 Dr. Mabry, um, in terms of the why, the purpose, does that shift? For an AP, what do you think? I think it does. I think there's a, there's an evolution to everybody. So in order, I mean, what brings you what brings you in may not be the same thing that sustains you. Just like a, it's like well, to me, the principalship is a relationship, right? It's a love relationship. So just like in a in a romantic relationship, what attracts you to somebody isn't what keeps you with them. It's that initial thing, but then as it as it gets sweeter, you fall in love with their heart as opposed to their face. So I think that there has to be an evolution. There's going to be a shift in why is this important? Why, why am I making this impact? Why am I deciding to spend my energy in this place? So, yeah, it's, it changes. Absolutely. Now, think about, you know, you've heard me talk about on here before. It's, it's, I guess it's one of my staples. That leader that does not walk in a purpose, because we, we know that that leader exists because I'm in a lot of rooms with leadership and I ask the question, what is your purpose? And I have people say to me all over this country, you know, that's a daggone good question because I haven't really thought about my leadership purpose. I know the school purpose, the school mission, the school vision, but in terms of my, my leadership purpose, I haven't really given that thought. So I wanna hear your perspective. Can a leader lead at an optimal level if the leader is lacking a defined purpose for leading i don't i don't think at an optimal level even if they're getting good results imagine how much better it could be if they had a true game plan or a true purpose or a or a true mission so i don't think they lead it on an optimal level and you hate to say this but it's true in education there are some buildings and some schools that really can run themselves mm -hmm. they just really need somebody to make sure you know lights on doors open They've, they've been working on automatic for so long that this just happens. I happen to have been a, a principal and a teacher in a building where it took great effort and great planning to, to lead it. Wasn't saying that, it, that, it, that great things couldn't happen, but you couldn't leave it to its own devices. And what happens is when you have leaders that, that step into a role because of money, because of getting away from the classroom, because I want to have the same schedule my children have, they find themselves struggling because they're not really there for that reason. Because the real reason in a building is the students. The students are the main thing. They're our core mission. That's right. And if you don't have a heart for the work for kids, it, it's going to be a struggle for you. And not saying you can't find your purpose or you can't define your purpose, um, but it may mean that you need to go up the mountain, you know, with a, with a good bottle of wine and spend a weekend and think through, why am I doing what I'm doing? Yeah. And when you come down, if, if you don't have an answer, then perhaps it's time to, you know, write a little note to the superintendent on a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. It might be time to get that transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. I love it. I love it. Hey, folks, sustaining a commitment to your vision during these challenging times. Hit that share button for me. Hit that retweet button. Hit that like button, particularly YouTube. Let them know we are here. Hey, Dr. Mabry, you moved to school. In your within your eight years from 34 percent to 80 percent graduation rate that is phenomenal it is worthy of a book a book written by you <laughs> it talks about how we got it done right if not a book then at least an article in one of the professional journals and you know those journals are out here so without for this first question being sensitive to to who was there before you without drawing any attention to your school or the district from from a leadership vantage point, what are the and, and again from a leadership vantage point on this question, what what are the factors that might contribute to a, a school with a with a low graduation rate? Well, I, I think that intentionality is key. It's got to be an intentionality of the of planning, of purpose. Um, you've got to really think about skill sets of teachers, um, administrators, uh, support staff. 
and you know nobody wants to tell the say this but the truth of the matter is you have a lot of times when you may have a senior teacher who is who's been there 10 15 years has great rapport great scores but won't teach ninth graders oh i i, I graduated from that but you have to put your strongest horses with your most fragile students and that's a culture shift that's a mind shift um that a new administrator has to kind of come in and bring to the table um, you have to talk from a place of, of real data, like where are we? But even with the 34% graduation rate, the school wasn't completely broken. So what are the bright spots? What are the things that are, are already working? Um, I had the great fortune of being uh, appointed to the principalship in April and I began July 1st. Mm. So I literally um, went and talked with the principal who had gotten another opportunity um, to lead in a, another area in the district and talked about what was going on. I did a SWOTS analysis with the students. I gave them a sheet of paper. What do you like about your school? What do you don't like about school? What would you like to see at your school? Real simple. Because again, to me, student voice is very important. Because again, a lot of time education is what happens to kids and we don't partner with kids. So let's talk, tell them what you, what you and you got crazy answers and silly things, but for the most part, they told the truth about what they liked about their school and what they wish they could see at their school. And it was really small things. And again, going back to the idea of who's your mentor, who's in your circle, um, I would always encourage once a leader, once you realize what building you're going into, find a place, maybe not in your district, in another district that has a similar demographic. One of the very first field trips I took after being appointed principal, I went down to Savannah, Georgia, and I met with a principal um, from Beach High School, which is a similar demographic to Butler High School, but had had great success. And I talked to the principal, didn't know him. Tell me what, tell me, you know, let me sit at your feet. Tell me what you did. Mm. And the first thing he told me was, he said, listen, the first thing you need to do because um, of the way the schools are structured, you need to come in and have one big instructional win. He said, when you have your first instructional win really big, that will ease attention that the central office is saying, okay, do they really know what they're doing? And then that'll give you some momentum to move forward from. And during that time, we used to um, administer the high school graduation test. So we literally came in. Um, I literally came in that first week of school, met with the ELA teachers. The writing test for the 11th graders is a big test. It's a graduation requirement. We've got to get it done. I want us to take the curriculum and focus solely on writing skills. Oh, but Dot, the benchmark says, it says mm -mm -mm. I, listen, I'll take it if y'all are off the pacing map. Mm -hmm. I want to concentrate on writing. I'll take it on the chin if they say something about the, about the the map. We literally had the highest gain in the district in writing. 94% of the junior class, when they took the test in November, passed the test. Big win in the paper parade. Wow. Big win. I took what Dr. Muhammad told me, and that was the, the best advice. Because again, that showed that I had intentionality, that I had vision, that I could execute a plan. It, it, it brought me a win with the community. It brought me a win with those folks who were from the central office who were looking, but it brought me a big win with the teachers. Why? Because they said, you know what? She's got our back. She listened to what we needed. She cleared the barriers. And if something was going to go down about it, she was going to take it. And I, and I tried to do that throughout my entire principalship. There were times when something would happen and we had to make some choices. And I said, you know what? We're going to choose B. If we get in trouble, no worries. I got you because this is what's best for children. You know something, Dr. Mabry, when you said you went to Savannah and you, you, you referenced, you said him, right? I said, she got to be talking about Dr. Muhammad. <laughs> right? And then when you said it, that's why I put my hand up. I said, my guy. Yeah. When, when, you know, when I met him, before I even had words with him, I just saw his demeanor, mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm talking about. And I said, this, 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 this dude is serious right here. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the thing that's, that's so amazing to me is, and I, and I don't want leaders to be afraid to do this, not knowing him. I mean, somebody set up a, an opportunity for me to talk to him, but not knowing him, good leaders, great leaders want to tell their leadership story. They want to walk you around their building. They want you to meet their kids. That, that's what they want. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be afraid to just reach out to somebody on social media, send a formal email. Hey, can I come and shadow you at your school? I just, I want to pick your brain. Yeah. And I, I've, I've never yet heard somebody say, oh no, I don't have time for that. Yeah. 
that's 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 where it is and and you know i i back in my principal days i got those invites and and those are just great times man people mm -hmm. from different parts of the country we just want to spend the day with you come on come on down you know doc you you kind of answered my next question but i'm gonna throw it at you anyway you um you said that you had a particular focus as it related to the writing and 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 teachers were worried about expectation pacing guys and all that kind of stuff and you but 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 your response was I got this. I'll, I'll take the hit. Right. So in other words, you had their back. So 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 my question to you was going to be and I guess this I could I could still ask it. What is the significance of the leadership when we talk about a school turnaround, when we talk about raising graduation rates? But in you saying what you said, you, you kind of spelled it out for me in terms of just letting the teachers know, I mean, in terms of one response, letting the teachers know, look, I got you on this. I got your back on this. Let's get this done because you had your own particular vision of how things had to be done rooted in that big victory that you needed, right? Thinking about, you know, let me, let me, let me try to keep myself from going on a tangent. Those sports teams that are not accustomed to winning, and then a coach comes in and says, we're going to win the division. We're going to win the conference. We're going to the playoffs. That's not realistic to the team because right. they don't have a history of winning. They have a history of losing. So now to come in and say, we're going to win not a little bit, but win big, like championship. It's like, are, are you serious? But here you came in, let's get this win, right? And as we, as we get this win, we could build on that win. So, so now teachers get the taste, students get the taste, a little victory. And now we could build on that and build on that and build on that. So let me still throw the question your way because, because there's someone out there that needs to hear your answer. What is the significance of principal leadership when we talk about turning around a school or raising graduation rates? Okay, so... When I was telling you about the, my vision for the school and that the most important person in a school building is the teacher, well, the most important person in a school district are your principals because they're the ones that are leading the charge in each one of those buildings. And they're the ones that are supporting those teachers. So as a principal, you can't know everything. Um, I'm going to say that I, that I was blessed enough because I had been at the central office. I had, I was a curriculum. I had just been the curriculum director. I know all about pacing guys, charts. I help write them. But I also knew how important showing up big on that assessment would be for the culture of the school, for the culture of the kids. Also remembering that we're dealing with kids. Well, these are Generation Z kids we have now. They are very instant gratification. So to tell a child in August, okay, we're going to do really, really good, and we're going to see how great we do on the test in April. They don't see that. They've got to see something much closer, much quicker. So how do you celebrate those small things? But like I was saying, being from the central office and having been in that administrative role, sitting down, making plans, sitting down, working with the State Department, I had a really intimate knowledge of um, like the Edgar guidance for funding. So when it came time to do budgets and budgeting, I knew what was allowable, what wasn't allowable. Just encyclopedically, I just knew that. So when somebody came to me with something innovative, I knew exactly where to look to see if it was allowable. And if it was allowable, and then somebody maybe the central said, well, no, we can't do that. So uh, 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 turn to page 42. See right here? Oh, well, yeah, I guess you can. I know I can. Mm. So again, you've got to be the one as the as a leader in the building to be able to come in with that knowledge. Again, you can't be a master of every content area, but you got to have enough generalist knowledge to be able to say, you know what, teachers? If this is something we think is going to help kids and, you, and you're ready to back this to the wall, then as your principal, I'm going to make it happen. Wow. I'm going to do the best I can to make it happen. It's good stuff. Great stuff. Great stuff. Let's look at your staff or mm -hmm. your staff or just us staff generically. However, what is it that you had to do or what is it that a principal would have to do to make believers of the vision of the principal? while simultaneously being committed to the vision of the principal. Because the principal, as you know, can come in with the big vision. Mm -hmm. But do, do the staff members, the ones on the front line teaching in those classrooms, share 
in that vision. Right. So first of all, I mean, of course, you got to cast a vision or whatever. But again, as a leader, taking things into smaller steps, because just like the kids want to see, are you for real? Oh, she says she's got an open door policy, but does she really have one? She says she's listening to what we're at, what we're asking for, but we never get the things that we need to get. When you you have to you have to um, under promise and over deliver. Mm. If a teacher comes and asks for X, Y, Z, then let's order it. Let's get it together. But it's got to be a, a systemic plan. They have to see that that you're committed not only to them, not only to the students, but to them as well. Um, and that's hard. And when you think about staffs, staff, you have to not only um, lead with intention, but you got to hire with intention. Probably one of the coolest things about Butler High School, and it's going to sound like an anomaly. And I used to tell people all the time, I, I work in Wakanda. Um, I had 21 men on my staff. Mm. And of those 21 men, 17 were African-American men. So there was not a department in my building that didn't have a man on, on staff. It wow. wasn't just the department of social, you know, it wasn't just the coaches and, and the, and the coaches that I had um, were academic teachers. So my basketball coach was a social studies teacher. My other basketball coach, my girls basketball coach was a math teacher. So mm -hmm. making sure that you're intentional in who you're hiring, who are you bringing on the team? When you first inherit, you can, you know, you have a lot of whatever is left. After that first year, second year, folks are going to leave because either they're going to buy into the vision or they're not. They're going to be some people who um, get better opportunities. There are going to be some people that are going to say, oh, she wants us to work too hard. Every time I turn around, it's a new initiative, a new plan, and she checks it. I, I'm not up for this. No worries. I still love you. Go on to the next place. Yeah. Um, but what that does is that draws, once people see that you're setting a vision, that you're um, that you have a culture that you're cultivating, folks will come. Um, I never really had big staffing issues at Butler um, because when, when one person wanted to leave, there was always somebody, two people in the wings that said, hey, doc, I heard you got a social studies opening. I do. I said, now, you OK, now working for me, you might. I, I, I would love to work for you. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Do you want to work with me? Because you, yeah, I'm different now. I'm, yeah. I'm not a little different for you. Um, but but really getting people to understand that you've got to be intentional as a leader. There has to be a plan for the plan and the plan has to be written down and it's got to be communicated as a leader. You can't have the plan all to yourself. Um, I'm one of the probably probably didn't happen often. I was a principal and I've, I've never been. I was never assistant principal. Um, so my first couple years of the principalship, I was learning how to be a uh, I was really a well-paid assistant. I was doing everything. I was trying to have all the stuff like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I realized that as a principal, that's a management role. And sometimes people call it, oh, she's a micromanager. Not The key word is management. Micro, macro, don't matter which one. Um, you have to manage the processes. But the processes have to be written down. You have to inspect what you expect. Yeah. But yeah. the teachers have to, the staff has to see that you are work, that they're not outworking you. We don't have the same role. But I'm there before you come. And when you leave, I'm going and Doc, what you doing over here at the, at the choir concert? Well, honey, I had to drop by because the altos was looking for me. I mean, you have to be um, you have to, you know, just lead and work with intention. But you got to have a plan without a plan. It's going to fall apart. That's right. Hey, like like my man, Salome Thomas L. <laughs> says a goal without a plan is a hallucination. Listen, you just put up a comment from Aaron Mills, who I taught back when he was in high school, class oh, of 1987. Really? He talking about you definitely different. Yes, Aaron, I'm different. And thanks to you, I made it through. Aaron was one of my best teachers, taught me a lot of stuff. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. And he, he I also saw him on on my thread when I was promoting. That's so, right, uh, yeah, yeah. Good to see you, Aaron Mills. You know, you said you said, Dr. Mabry, earlier that the, the principal was the most important person in the district. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I've, I've interviewed for several superintendent positions that I walked away from. Uh, I didn't want them, but I accepted the invitation to at least sit in on the interview. And in all those interviews, I said to the folks, to the board members present, that the most important person in the district for me as a superintendent is the, is the principal. Mm -hmm. As important as students are, that principal. So therefore... I've got to be allowed to spend ample time in schools, not micromanaging and not being breathing down their back. But I need to see that school. I need to be able to see the leadership without seeing the leader. Right. And if I can't do that, 
then I, I can't evaluate. I can't supervise that person because I don't know what's happening in there beyond the abstract. I got to be there. So I'm saying that to say to somebody, maybe some of the new principals who are watching, I concur. The principal, that's the most important position. That matters. You could have dynamite teachers in a classroom. But if that leadership is ineffective, if that leadership is weak, then you may not see the greatness in those teachers because the leadership, that glue is not there to, to, to bring all that together into that one cohesive unit. So so, so, so it's important because I don't want somebody hitting me up saying, wait, 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 I'm going to teach them. No, you important. But that leadership is that glue, man. Absolutely. That leadership. The teacher, the teacher is the most important person in the building. Because they they have that's the main thing work, but when we talk about a district, the principals are the most important because they're the ones that are independently. Like our district has fifty seven schools in it. You have fifty seven CEOs, wow, who are working on the behalf of the district. They they're the chief they're the chief executive officer of that building. It rises and falls on them. Um, and it has to be seen in that matter, and they have to be supported. And I think that that's a place that. I see just in the educational space, not necessarily in my school system, but in the educational space where I feel like there's um, some more work needs to be done, like the principal project and the Wallace Foundation talk about principal support, principal mentoring, um, principal coaching. That's a place that we're getting to in our educational space, but it's much needed because that's why you have such a great turnover. Um, you know, the average superintendent lasts, what, three to five years? Well, the same is true for principals um, and are gone are the days where principals, um, I feel like when I was a little girl, you know, you might be the principal for 17 years in the building. Yeah. <laughs> the, work is, the work is too powerful, it's too impactful, it's too stressful for that amount of time. So if you're going to have to have that turnover, you've got to have continuity, even in turnover um, and transition. Good stuff. Hey, folks, I'm winding down. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I was over ambitious, as always, in writing my questions. So I'm not going to do them all. It's, it's, I know y'all got a day, got a whole day ahead of you, but hang in there with me. I'm winding it down. Let me get these quick, these, these four or five quick ones. Again, sustaining a commitment to uh, your vision during challenging times. So with the following, these are real quick, uh, Dr. Uh, Mabry. Um, I got the AP in my mind on all five of them. Given the times we're in, and, and, and I don't mean pandemic times, I just mean they challenging time. They were challenging 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. They always challenging. So given mm -hmm. the times, how did you and how does one sustain a high level of belief in one's ability to lead at a high level? How would, how would you or how would just somebody that you recommended sustain a high level of belief in one's ability to lead effectively? <sighs> That, that's that's a hard thing to do because even the best leader is going to have some doubt and some second guessing. But again, you have to always put it in context. How well is this working? May not be working as well as I thought it should be working, but it is making an impact. And sometimes you put together something and it may only impact one kid, but that one kid is forever changed because of your work. So you remain the belief by just you got to keep keep the faith. You got to keep going. But you are going to have those days you're going to be like, am I suited for this? <laughs> this is not what I'm suited for. That's right. Real, as they say, real talk and real world. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I think Labrina is out in Germany, walking in the vision, mission, educating in Germany, supporting all stakeholders while teaching supports leaders and community partners. If you are in Germany, which I guess you must be, Labrina, I appreciate you uh, checking in with us this morning. Um, uh, let me preface this next question this way, Doc. Um, as a black edge, as a black principal, whether it be a black teacher, black principal, as a black principal, I had a certain I, I, I felt a certain obligation from a historical context to be the best, to be my best me. Right. It was one thing as a person, as an individual that I want to be the best version of myself. But I also felt as a black man, as a black principal and even my days as a teacher, as a black teacher, that in, in that context, I had to be great. I had to be the best me that I could possibly be. So it was this sense of obligation. So I wanna ask you, did, do, did you ever feel a sense of obligation within a historical context? 
Oh, absolutely. And, and I'm going to add, a, I'm going to add a layer to this that you can't possibly add. Um, Butler High School in, you know, had been around since 1960. Um, the first African-American principal was uh, my predecessor, but I was the first female principal um, out of a lineage of 40 some oh. years. Um, and the idea that being a black um, person, but then being a black woman leading a high school, that was a whole different dynamic because there's a, a thought that, you know, first of all, there are certain spaces that are for women, those elementary spaces. Um, to lead a high school is a um, is a, a big deal, but then just to be that the first woman to kind of break the ceiling um, was huge. And then when I came to Butler, um, one AP there was a black female AP that was there for um, instruction. I hired another black female um, AP, so there were three black women running a high school, and I think that made people a little nervous. So they sent us over for ninety days a man to help us. And at the end of the 90 days, he was a retired principal. And at the end of the 90 days, he said, um, I don't know why they sent me over here. Y'all got this. I mean, you know, so just the idea that there are some people, even in the even in the 21st century, that think, well, some spaces really aren't for women. Some places really aren't for black women. So yeah, in the historical context, you always have to be thoughtful about that. And I but I think that um those pieces of me or those those different lenses of me brought something different to the table that wouldn't have come had they hired a different person um, to lead during that time. So it was good stuff. I appreciate you sharing that too. So brought a man over. Oh yeah. To help me. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We got, we got to continue to strive to change the times that we're, we're living in, in that regard. I kept this young lady up for deliberately. I, I had her up and then I, I, I put some others up and then I put her back, Vicki Gallman back. So this is this is a, a friend of mine up in upstate New York, part of my Black Educators Rock family. And I might mention that the president of Black Educators Rock has been on the whole time, Dr. Melissa Nolan Chester. And I might plug our conference in July. Um, but, you know, we'll, I'll, be, I'll have more information about that later. But we do the annual conference every July. Uh, we'll be in person this year. But Vicki Gallman Baxter, who's a part of our family, ju was just appointed as uh, assistant principal uh, right. this, this week. So she'll start, I guess, beginning in January. So clap her up, y'all. Give us some love on them comments, man. Yeah, Vicki Gallman Baxter. She's in the position. She's been working hard to get there for a while. And now here she is. So I could not um, avoid... Um, just giving her her props here. So, uh, and a lot of y'all on here, y'all know her because a lot of people that come on here are part of the part of our family. Oh, she starts. She said. She said Tuesday. All right, so honey. No, 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 like, we, we had to imagine that we at the end of the year, <laughs> right? <laughs> and instead of January, she got that last week. Right, no time. That like new capacity. That's that's something different. So I see y'all congratulating. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's how we do here, man. We found when you come into this virtual AP Leadership Academy, we family on this bad, mm -hmm. right? I, I got I got I got two more for you, Doctor Mabry. Given the times, and this is closely related to the belief question, but given the times that we're in, how would you, how did you, or how would one sustain their sense of drive and determination toward continuing to strive to meet these goals? Right. So, I mean, again, you got to think about what feeds you as an educator, what feeds you as a person. So, again, I... I I am on the Virtual AP Leadership Academy every Saturday. This podcast, well, this cast feeds me. Um, even in my current position, it, it still gives me insight. So what are those things that you're plugging into that feeds your soul? That's the way that you keep your drive up. What are you reading? I mean, um, who are you stalking on Twitter? If you're not on Twitter, in Ooh. the educational space on, in Twitter, you're missing out. You're That's missing right. out. Um, you've got to plug in. There are so many... Um, dynamic educators, whether they're uh, famous educators like Rudy Kafele, down to people who are practitioners like me, who are just sharing the good news of what's going on, passing articles, those kinds of things. So what are you what are you feeding into? What are you plugging into? And again, what conferences are you attending? Um, you talked about the Black Educators Rock Conference, but are you going to ASCD? Are you going to um, National Youth at Risk? What are you going to that feeds your soul? And I'm going to say this, it's going to sound crazy. 
Sometimes you go to a conference that comes out of your pocket. Doesn't matter if the district supports it or not. What are you willing to put a few hundred dollars down to be able to kind of hone your craft? What, how are you sharpening your saw? That's how you keep your drive. And, and, and you know how, how I word that, Dr. Mabry? I'm, I, I ask, are you willing to invest in yourself? Indeed. Right. You, you, I mean, we'll, we'll spend the money on whatever we spend it on, our needs and our wants. But in terms of that conference, are you willing, if the district won't pay for it, are you willing to pay for the registration, the airfare, the hotel, the ground transportation, the meals, the books that they're selling, you know, and, and whatever else. Are, right. are you willing? And willing right. to give up your, your three personal days out of your um personal day leave bank. Absolutely. Okay. That's it. You got and, and let's just 60 seconds. Let's stay here. Man. Hey, somebody out there, because I hear it all the time. I didn't come to the conference because I'm, I'm, you know, I might be the keynote. I'm like, hey, why didn't you come to the conference? Man, the district wasn't paying for it. Wasn't paying for it. How about you invest in yourself, man? I used to do it, and this was back salaries were a lot lower than they are now. And I paid my way to Vegas. I wasn't the speaker. I was the guy that sat on the front row trying to get the information from Harry Wong. <laughs> How about that? Harry Wong was the keynote speaker. I'm sitting there trying to get the information, not knowing that about five years later, me and Harry Wong would keynote together in, in St. Thomas Virgin Islands. Right? <laughs> that was a special day for me because I had sat in that conference just to get information as a brand new assistant principal. And Harry Wong was the keynote on the Vegas Strip at, at, at the Sands Hotel. I, I got all that stuff memorized. I can tell you the date, too. Right. So. <laughs> So, so here's the thing, y'all. Real quick, last question. Has, has, has your overall vision shifted or changed in any capacity, uh, Dr. Mabry, as a result of you being now the director or coordinator of uh, MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support? Does, does that shift your vision in terms of your role in your, in your le within your leadership capacity? I'm going to tell you what shifted. Um, I think I was always, I, I know I was always an access and equity person. I was always worried about what opportunities my students had, et, et cetera. But I think equity has become a capital letter word. It's a, it's a, a proper pronoun now in my lexicon. Um, if we are not providing equitable opportunities for students, we are doing a disservice. It's malpractice. So I think that's been the shift, the, 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 the importance of equity, the, um, the, the purpose behind equity, and how that happens across a landscape. And again, when you're in a school building, I got 800 that I'm worried about. But now at the back at the district office, when I sit down and I talk with the facilitators and principals, et cetera, about um, MTSS and what it means, we've got to have an equitable distribution across the entire district. And then there should be somebody in another place having that same equitable conversation across districts, across states. And the sad part is, um, and I said this the other day in a, in a meeting, the quality of a child's education should not be dependent upon their zip code. But oftentimes it is. Mm -hmm. So same city, same transportation system, same lunch system. But because you go to school in this part of the city as opposed to this part of the city your access and your opportunity are not the same and that's not fair to kids yep. and then we say, well they're not producing well we didn't give them the opportunity which is which is what kind of tethered me to you in the very beginning you were one of the first people you and pedro Nogueira were taught we're not talking about the achievement gap you were talking about the attitude that gap the opportunity gap yeah let's stop looking at the, the in in game and saying well, oh the kids are so pitiful no no, no. what do we do for them in the beginning yeah what was what was our what was our attitude when we reached out to them? What opportunities did we afford them? And then if we've done everything right there and we still have this outcome, hmm. But the truth of the matter is, kids come from so many different things and they get so many different opportunities. And then when they don't fare well, everybody's looking like I don't know what happened. Well, I do. Yeah, how about that? Equity, you know, is and, and, and I didn't even actually I had questions with that. Those are some of the ones I didn't get to. Next time. But 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 you know something, equity, as I always say, equity is everything. Mm -hmm. And it burns me up, as you've heard me say on here before, when a client asks me, request of me not to mention the word equity. 
you know, I, I, you know, I'm skillful enough to have a way of doing a whole six hour presentation on equity and, and the client doesn't know what hit them. Right. So, so, so I can go in there and not say the word, but teach equity all day long because mm -hmm. equity is everything. But, but depending on my frame of mind, I might just say to the client, why don't you find yourself another speaker? Right. So it's a, it boils down to just what do I, what, how am I, how am I internalizing the request of not speaking on equity or going on and, 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 and taking the, taking the contract, but now circumventing the word, but staying true to the content of meeting young people where they are as they are. That is my definition of equity, and I will stand on it forever. And all money ain't good money. So therefore, if you want me to break who I am in order for you to be okay, hmm, not necessary. That's right. Next client. That's it. Let's go to them BAM impact questions. All right, let's go. Winding it down. We got 21 for you. One, one word or one sentence answer. If you go over a sentence, I'm going to cut you off. Please right? don't. I'm going to try to be good. <laughs> Here we go. Is education on the right path for underserved children? No. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown, and other underserved students? It could. Does Dr. Stacy Mabry's work contribute to the progress we desperately need? I hope so. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? It would be the same. Why do you continue to do this work? Because I love it. What fires you up within the work that you do? Kids. What do you love most about the work you do? Kids. What do you dislike about the work you do? Bureaucracy. Yeah. What has been your greatest victory in this work? The outcomes of the students that I've taught. What was your greatest mistake in this work? Greatest mistake was not realizing my impact when I was a teacher. Not real, not being as intentional, but I was young. I didn't know. Mm. What has been your greatest challenge in this work? Um, naysayers, people thinking that, you know, well, maybe she can't do it. That's been my biggest challenge. You know, I like to prove people wrong. There you go. Are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal? Never was assistant principal. Oh, OK. OK. Next one. Are you proud of your first year as a principal? Very much so. Who inspires you in the work that you do? <sighs> Baruti Kafele, Bonita Coleman. Um, I got colleagues like Shelly Allen, Lisa Norwood, um, great teachers. It just There's a host of folks. I got a whole tribe. There you go. There you go. Um, what are you reading right now? Book, blog, article, anything? Uh, the Light We Carry, Michelle Obama. Oh, okay. What book do you recommend for our viewers? Um, well, anything in the Kefele stable. Um, <laughs> but I would definitely tell you to, to, the one that I started with was the Attitude Gap. Because, again, that that foundationally set for me like, OK, why are we focusing so much on these test scores and this achievement? What what are we doing? What's our what's our role in it? I appreciate that. What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished just yet? I think I think I would like to one day lead a district myself. I mean, I, I aspire. Um, I love that. Wow, I love that. Are you satisfied with where you are professionally now? Never satisfied. That's me. What could you say to a viewer out there who continues to face closed doors? Um, keep knocking. Move to another door. Make a way. What build a say tunnel. To, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, build a tunnel. Do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. What could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? You've got to find that the thing that 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 stokes that fire. And as a principal, one thing that always worked for me when I was having those down moments, go where the children are. That's where the joy is. Yeah. Go to your SIDBID classroom, go to your MOID classroom, go to the classroom with your most fragile children in it and, and see the joy in their faces from the smallest things. It'll put you in perspective. I love it. I need, you know, I need to do a whole session on that because you, 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 you right on, you right on point. Last one. If, if Dr. Stacy Mabry was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? 
my definition would be a love supreme. Um, John Coltrane talked about in, when he wrote the, the title of his, um, his work, Love Supreme, that music was his devotion to God and, and how all that intertwined. Education and being an educator is how I express the highest form of God. It's a love supreme. It's everything. Like it's, it's tattooed on me. It is. Wow. It's everything. So love that would be my definition. I love, love Supreme. Supreme. I'm glad you said that because I've seen I've seen it on your pages, and um, now you explain what it is. Love Supreme. I probably should have asked you. Hey, Doctor yes. Mabry, as that I, cold I, he got it uh, now. Yeah, I got I took, it. On cold train. Yeah, you hit it out the park. And uh, folks, I see you already started with the applause. So yeah, for those of you that may be new to us. Just hit us up with some emojis if you got something out of this today, if it resonated with you, if it fired you up, if it empowered you, if you benefited from it, if you could use what you got. Give us some fire. Give us some bombs. Give us some hearts. Give us some praise. Give us some whatever it is that you use as an emoji. Just put it in the thread so so Dr. Mabry can see it. And while, and while you're doing so, let me let me get my Louisville slugger out here. OK. And, and, and definitely you you hit a grand slam. Hit it right out the park. I know you right by that Mercedes Benz Stadium. Okay, so you, yes, sir. You, you, hit, you hit it right out of Mercedes Benz, man. <laughs> you hit it right out. So great stuff. I'm so happy. So elated to have you on here today. This, I'm sure that folks that want to reach out to you, there were questions on there. So when you get a chance, a free moment, take a look at it because there, there's a lot of questions people were asking you. Absolutely. I just didn't put them on because I wanted to stay focused. But um, how can people get in touch with you? Um, hit me up on social media. I'm I'm on Twitter. I'm on um, uh, at Urban Magnolia on Twitter, and then of course on Facebook, um, Stacy Mabry. Send me a, a private message. I'm gonna get to that. Kafele has inspired me. I don't have a book. I don't have a blog. It's time to put some stuff out there in the atmosphere. I'm, I'm gonna get it together. That's it. That's it. And I see Jamie Treadwell McCord out there. That's my girl, Masara. Yeah. And she, she, you know, my, my list is like long. You know, I got this long list of folks that I'm going to be calling. And I, I think I told her before, but I'll tell you again live right now. You on that list, Dr. McCord. I'm, um, sure. I, I, I got to get you on here. I just, it's just timing, but, but you on that list. Right. Look, but, a daughter um, of South Carolina State. She's too, a South Carolina State graduate like me. Oh, okay. Okay. There you go. There you go. There you go. So look here, folks. Uh, let me go through the rundown. Uh, Dr. Maybe stay with me even when I sign off, right? Okay. Um, next week I got two, you know, many of you will recall, I brought two first year principals on recently. Um, I, I, I think I might've been, no, I wasn't in Jamaica on that one, but it was near that time. Well, next week I'm bringing on two second year principals. I want to get their perspective on what things have been like thus far They're in the middle of the second year. So that's going to be one of the family members, Carlos Baggage. You all have seen his name a million times and I always big him up when I see him. And another uh, young man by the name of Sean Sawyer, from who's a Jersey guy, he's out here where I am. So Carlos Baggage and Sean Sawyer, they don't know each other, but we're going to have a good conversation about being second year principals. Well, how can that how can how can their information benefit those of us out here who are watching? Uh, so be t stay tuned. Uh, be with us next week. Stay tuned. We'll be on. That'll be Christmas Eve. I ain't going nowhere. I'll be sitting right here. I'm going to be here right? too. Appreciate it. Next week, Sean Hurt, 10 o'clock. If you missed him today, you can go to my page and um, it's sitting right on my page. He was on at 10. Create and educate with the two doctors, Dr. Sheikha Houston and Dr. Tammy Taylor, 1030 every Saturday. You can go back and check that one out. Facebook Live, Unlock the Middle, Josh Tovar, Dean Packard, 7 o'clock Sunday nights. You're watching the football game. Check them out at the same time. And then Village Leadership Group, uh, Dr. Rods Gaskins and Coach Williams. That's Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6. Once again, um, the two joints that go with this, the Assistant Principal 50, the Aspiring Principal 50, you can get it at Amazon. Gift yourself. And then while you're there, you know, get my equity and social justice education 50, right? And then while you're there... He's some of my others, right? So they just put my name in the Amazon search engine and um and you'll see all my my ASCD books, right? Um principalcafele.com is where you get all my other resources, you know, you my the, the articles, the blog posts, the videos, the audios, all that stuff is there. I told you about the two articles I wrote for Learning Forward. They made the top 10 for 2022. 
that was a blessing for me. Not one of my articles made the top 10, but two of my articles of six that I wrote for them this year made the top 10. You can go to principalcafele.com, scroll down to my announcements, and then you'll see the link for the two articles. Check them out. If you want to read all six and go to go to um, my writings link on principalcafele.com and click that and you'll see them sitting there right on top. Subscribe to the Virtual AP Leadership Academy YouTube channel. Make sure you, you and make sure on Facebook and all that stuff you 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 set it up for them notifications so you know when I'm on at 10:55 every Saturday because some of y'all be forgetting. You tell me I forgot to tune in. Well, hit hit that notification button so that every time I come on, you know, right? And then um, where we at? Like and follow the Facebook Virtual AP Leadership Academy uh, page because the commentary. I keep reminding folks this academy is not just Saturday. Saturday is half. The other half is the commentary on Sunday. I write that and I post it before 10 o'clock Sunday mornings. The only place you can see that is on that page. So Virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page, like and follow that. And then you can check those out. If you missed them all, I got I wrote 90 of them. You got to scroll down and read them all. Right. So because uh, that's the only place you can get them. And then lastly, your diet, your exercise, COVID precautions, all that good stuff. Make sure you're taking care of yourselves, folks. Eat right. Live right. And, and, and extend your life for as long as you can. Um, we talked about the emotional health, the, the mental health this, um, earlier when I came on. Watch the video at the beginning and, and just hear my words, my commentary about just making sure that mentally that you're okay, that you're fine, right? Other than that, have a great week. No, first, thanks for being here. Thanks for being here, folks. Gotta thank you. Gotta thank you. Thanks for being here, everybody. Tell a friend, join us next week. Have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. There you go. Cock that fist back. One, two, three. Bam! Bam! <laughs> I see, it's, see, it's nice when you got family and they know the whole routine, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see y'all next week.